so I'm finally, finally, finally getting to the video where I'm going to talk about moving back to America, leaving Qatar, leaving the Middle East, and just that whole transition process. Because I think online, it's very easy to see um, the glamorousness of moving abroad. No one ever talks about what it's like to actually move back home. Um, and so for a while, um, I've moved back home. I was in Qatar for almost about like a year and a half or so, maybe a year and a half, two years, almost a year and a half. And um, it was this life-changing experience. It was great. If you saw on Instagram, uh, you guys know how amazing that journey has been. Moving abroad was my dream for years. Um, but again, I moved home for a lot of different reasons. I moved home to continue running my shop. I moved home to connect. Um, family, I think I said this in another video, um, if you have not seen that, um, kind of what my experience was like being in Qatar, you can definitely check that out, I'll have it linked, but, you know, I moved home to, I want to go on dates, I want to get married, I want to, like, have kids, I want to, like, I want to do all the things that grown-ups should be doing at my age, I feel like, so, and it, and it just seemed like I, I don't know if that was possible there, so I'd much rather move home, solidify some things, um, just kind of live a more relaxed, calm life, basically. Um, and I can always circle back to moving overseas, but I necessarily can't circle back to this point in time in my life. So all that to be said, I moved back home with a plan. I knew, or at least I thought I knew what was going to happen next, what the game plan was, what my timeline was, what my money was going to look like. And literally, as soon as the plane landed, all of that went out the window. All of it. Um... I won't go into maybe a lot of details, just like family-wise, but you know, family's stressful. Um, and as soon as I got home, I cried that first night. I had a panic attack that first night. Um, just wondering, like, what did I do? Was this a mistake? You know, this was a mistake. <laughs> this was a mistake. Um, and it took a couple days to come down from that. Um, you know, and again, if you see me and if you're following me on Instagram, like I'm trying to be more honest and, and just more transparent and using the words like anxiety or using the words depressed, you know, cause I feel like socially we use those words really loosey goosey, but you know, we're not necessarily talking about like real clinical anxiety, real clinical depression. So trying to, trying to be more transparent about that. So I was definitely having uh, some episodes um, and it took me a while to resettle, but I knew immediately, right, that relaxed timeline that I thought I was going to be on, that timeline where I thought, um, you know, take a few months, <laughs> you know, we got money saved, you know, we'll travel, you know, we'll, we'll live this fully, you know, creative, content creating shop, entrepreneurial life. We'll live that life for a little bit um, while we figure things out. And I knew as soon as I got home, right, I need to find a job. I can't be here in Connecticut. I need to get back to New York. I need my own space so I can breathe and exhale. Um, and so for you guys who know New York, New York is hella expensive. And so you can't just like, <laughs> you know, just be out here in these nitty gritty concrete jungle streets. So I'd interviewed, I'd gotten um, a couple interviews pretty right away, thank God. Um, and so moved back to New York, did a couple trips, went home to the Virgin Islands with my mom, um, but hit the ground running in New York, got an apartment, um, got the job, this initial job, um, and I just started working. So that job, it was for grant writing and I thought, great, you know, it's not necessarily like the therapeutic clinical hospital work that I've been doing, but it's very similar in that I've worked one person programs. I've been a director for programs where I had to literally build up, you know, an entire pediatric creative arts play therapy um, child life program myself. And so you have to know how to write grants. And so got to this job and it was a mess, <laughs> you know, so it was another stressful moment where I thought I was kind of leaving a stressful situation only to land into a stressful situation. Funny enough, you know, it was working for immigrants and refugees, particularly of the Middle East. And I thought, what a great transition. You know, I can continue some of the work that um, I've been doing in the Middle East and just like working with children and families, but I can do it in a different capacity. And, and it was very interesting. Like I got there and literally, unfortunately, if you know about nonprofits, what tends to happen, there's this idea of hurting 
you know, tons of people to try and help, um, but do they have the staffing, the money, the resources to actually do it? No. Uh, and so that's where a lot of grant funding and a lot of grant writing comes in. Unfortunately, when I got there, work hadn't been looked at, I feel, for the past, what, three to six months. So when I started, it was like, oh, great, you're here. Here's all the work that we've not been working on or looking at. Um, yeah, and they're all due tomorrow. Yay! <laughs> and, you know, and this expectation that I was some sort of miracle worker. Um, and I think just for my own career, fortunately, unfortunately, I've had some really crazy you know, not positive work situation. So I knew, like, I could pretty much, like, I walked into that space and I recognized bullshit immediately. <laughs> I recognized the bullshit immediately. And I was like, right, this right here, the computer that doesn't really work consistently, you know, the work that's behind, the passwords that don't work, the links that aren't working, the deadlines that are almost practically past due, I, I recognize this and this is not going to work for me. So I actually continued interviewing, um, never really stopped. I was there for about three, <laughs> three paychecks when I quit. And I think the last straw for me was me coming into work one day. I ran into, you know, a young man on the street, you know, a homeless teen, um, African-American, Caribbean boy. We chopped it up for a bit. I gave him the link to come into the center and when I got to work I was very emotional right like I, I felt like I could do more I wanted to do more and talking to my colleagues about what some of the options were did I do the right thing could I have done more and seeing one of like the c-level folks kind of walk by and I saw it out the corner of my eye I didn't think anything of it you know and then she walks by again and then finally she pulls me over to her office and she's like you know I just get the sense that you're talking too much. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm talking too much. I'm actually talking about helping the population that we're supposed to be serving here. Um, and I let her know that. But between that and like randomly moving my seat unannounced, I come in, my stuff's been moved to another, you know, part of the office, kind of like we're in school. And it's like, no, this feels very much like a sweatshop. Um, and I use that word, knowing the weight of it, it felt like a sweatshop. And I was like, yeah, this is not going to work for me. So I sat there that Friday um, afternoon, knowing that there was a whole lot of crap down the pipeline that was due, that had been due. Um, and as I said, no one had been looking at, so it suddenly fell on me. So if it didn't get done, you know, it was Angela not working. Um, and I just realized that like, this is not it. So I cleaned up the desk quietly typed up some emails of like, here's what I've been working on, here's where I left off, went home, typed up my resignation letter, and I sent it first thing Monday morning, um, that yeah, this is effective, immediately I quit. And I think that there's this idea, you know, they were operating from a space, A, often, you know, young black women, or just black women in general, sometimes can fall into the trap of being the workhorses. Um, in corporate spaces or just in workspaces in general, you know, we're the we're the ones where all the work is hoisted upon um, and expected to perform with a smile um, and not to complain. And there was no recognition that things had fallen off the rails before I even gotten there. And some, you know, I've ha I saw coworkers who started after me, and her reception was very different than mine. Um, you know, and then also I think. The second space, they were just operating from, you know, thinking that, yes, I'm new in the country, again, young, black, brown, like I didn't have options. And I think if you look at my resume, or they should have, like, I've been, for lack of a better word, like, I've been a bad work bitch for a long time. <laughs> like a long, long, long time. Like I was running my own shit before I came to this grant writing sweatshop. And so, um... I had options. Thankfully, I paid off, you know, all of my bills, you know, before moving back to America. So I had money saved. I had my credit cards paid off. The only thing I had to really worry about was rent. Um, but it wasn't where I was in a situation where I this had to be it, you know. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of folks, especially, you know, in the inner city, like a lot of folks, this has to work, you know, like there's no other choice. And for me... You know, and I, I know I'm speaking from privilege, like, 
I finished grad school early. I have my master's. I've been working for a long while. Um, I've been interviewing and continue to be interviewing. Like, I didn't need this. And so I said that <laughs> very politely, you know, politically correct. Just that it was a mutually um, probationary period. Because I think a lot of employers, they are working under the assumption that probation periods are just about the employee and not about the employers, the business themselves also being judged. So as much as they were judging me, I was judging them. And I was like, this ain't, this ain't gonna work for me. Like, so this is effective like now. <laughs> this is effective now. Because I found myself, you know, going to that place of work anxious as fuck every day. Um, and that was something that was like, I am working to prioritize my mental health and there was no way that I was going to bring work home because it was already behind um, before me getting there. And there was no way that I was going to allow other people to belittle and demean the work that I know that I'm able to do. And so that was it, <laughs> you know, and I didn't get any, I didn't, the only thing I think I got was from HR and that, you know, hey, we'd love to do an exit interview, but I feel like I pretty much said all that I needed to say in that resignation letter and people know what it means when you say you know the, the there's this is not a, a match or it's not a positive work culture um i can't remember all of what i said but you know the mutually re the respective judging of um the probation period you know what it means when someone says that there's like a toxic work culture. <laughs> you know what that is. Like, I don't need to come in and do another interview with that. I'm not filling out a survey. Just have my check. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. So then it was another space and time of I accepted a position. And then thankfully the universe was providing. I was given another position. So then do I quit the confirmed thing I'd gone through you know all of the onboarding process for you know another I'd gone back to the clinical medical work that I usually do do I give this thing up that's secure and risk it to go with another hospital and another offer and so you know that period was just so extended and I think just transitioning from overseas back to America there's a lot of like mechanisms and things that people don't it doesn't make sense for them. Like even getting an apartment, they want W-2s. Well, internationally, W-2s don't exist. So what do you want me to give you? Um, or yeah, like background checks. And it's like, well, can you get this paper from, you know, this hospital overseas? I mean, I could try, but, but people operate very differently in other countries. And so I got all the paperwork, at least I thought, before leaving the country because I know how difficult it can be. So. You know, and it was just very, it didn't compute, I think, for a lot of folks in trying to get an apartment, in trying to, like, resettle and, and get jobs and background checks and get documents and all these things. Like, it doesn't compute for Americans that people would actually leave America, A, and live overseas, B. And so when you come back, they, like, kind of don't know what to do with you, um, which was super stressful. So I was, like, unemployed, fun employed for about eight weeks or so. And it's all cute until like <laughs> money runs out. Um, New York is super expensive to be creative, but not really actively bringing in income. So I was spending my savings and spending credit cards and things. So I'm, you know, I'm still paying New York rent. I'm living in Manhattan still. Um, but thankfully everything came together. And I say all this to say, and maybe I'll continue like to chat more and do a series. Like, trust your gut, you know, like never let anyone belittle you. Um, and I think in my moment, like I, I said, I was operating from a place of of privilege. I was operating from a place of privilege, but yet and still, um, you know, even if, for example, I didn't have savings, I would have probably still have worked that grant position while actively looking for other jobs. It just so happened that, you know, as I was looking for that job um, and I'd gotten it, I never stopped taking phone calls and interviews um so yeah like, it's just very interesting and it's very interesting that i left a middle eastern country where you know i was treated well i think you know because and I, again, i've talked about this because of my u.s passport but i saw what it is to have other country 
other people from other nationalities from other countries not treated as equally only to come back to work for a Middle Eastern Arab uh, company in the U.S. and had to have them try to treat me that way. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> that ain't going to happen. That's not happening. But um, it's, it's literally just kind of stepping out on faith and believing that that net will appear. So that's been my journey. It's I've been off and on social media, um, just trying to get my head together. If you can imagine that, plus you know all of the other stressors of just reacclimating to a country um, that you've been away from for so long, and you know you're completely a different person now. Um, you try to chat people up about your experiences, and you can share a couple things, but people, unless you've moved away don't really get it you know and particularly the middle east it's a very different um work living dynamic and you can kind of see it online but unless again you've lived it and you know kind of the stressors that come with expat living and then trying to reacclimate reacclimate back home you know it's hard and I, you know, I've been blessed in that, you know, I, I have someone who has done that. Um, and so being able to like chat with him has been a lifesaver, honestly, because you need to like have someone to talk to these, talk these things out with. Um, so yeah, that is it guys. I have been MIA for a bit. I'm honestly still trying to figure out my life figure out what I want. <laughs> I think some of the things that the plans that I thought I had and the things that I thought I wanted, I'm still, I'm deciding now whether I actually want those things. Um, but yeah, that's it. I, I think I end like my blog. The journey continues. It is a constant journey. I have a few things that I'm thinking in my mind, things that I feel like I would love to do, but yeah, it's, I'm still figuring that out. Yeah. All right. Till then, thank you guys for watching, for tuning in. If you have questions for me, of course, you can leave them and comment below. Um, three months from now, I'll be hopping back on this travel adventure life tip. So, yeah, if you have ideas of places where you think I should go, you can let me know that too. All right. Bye.